Hello everybody! Gamar Khatimatova. I hope your Yom Kippur is going well so far. We wanted to supplement your Yom Kippur experience of all the online services with the following Yom Kippur video. This was a question and answer session Atid had with Rabbi Wolpe this past Thursday. Topics are all about forgiveness and Yom Kippur and how we should think about this upcoming year in the face of this pandemic. So with that, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it helps to elevate your Yom Kippur experience. Shana Tova, Gamar Chatimat Tova, and let's get this year started off on the right foot. Bye everybody, enjoy the video. And this is something that older people always say to younger people, okay? So you're welcome to dismiss this as, oh, this is something that older people always say to younger people. Nonetheless, since I am older and you are younger in this context, I will say it anyway. Um, don't limit yourself by what you assume you can or can't do in this world, because believe me, life is filled with surprising turns. So when I say, think about what it is you wanna be after this pandemic, like just for a moment, think if I had no limitations, what is it that I would be? Um, and here I actually, do think that Judaism teaches that if every human being is a spark of God and everybody is essentially um, put on this world to realize some sort of mission, so what is yours? The Kotzka Rebbe once said, uh, don't spend your life being someone else because then who will be you, right? Since you're the only person that can be you, try to figure out really deeply what that means. Take other people's opinions seriously, but they don't get a veto. They get a vote, but not a veto. You ultimately have to live your life and you cannot, as much as you want to, you can't actually farm it out to someone else or think of someone else as responsible for your choices. Um, so that's one thing that I think is really important in the pandemic is that it gives you this space for re-envisioning. The second thing, and, and, and I'll close with this because, uh, there's so much more to talk about. But the second thing that I think is important is that it should also create a, an awareness, which I, again, I'm gonna play the generational card, which I actually think your generation had much more than mine already, but nonetheless, it should create an awareness of the fact that all human beings are, are intimately interconnected. Um, this is the first thing that has ever happened in human history where everybody was involved and everyone knew that everybody was involved. So 10 years from now, if you run across someone from Belize, you will be able to say to them, what were you do, doing during the pandemic? And you'll know that they know what you mean. That's an amazing thing. Um, and I will give you a very short preview of one thing that I'm gonna talk about on Yom Kippur, which illustrates this really nicely. Uh, in one of the sermons, I'm gonna mention a book um, that was, it was called to my attention by another rabbi, Danny Pressman. And I think it's called A Journey of Gratitude. And it's by a guy named A.J. Jacobs. And what he decided to do was he was gonna thank everyone who was responsible for his morning cup of coffee. And it ended up being thousands of people. I mean, not he started with the barista, but there are all the manufacturers and the shippers and the and the the unions and the people who brought and he ends up taking a plane and a boat and a van to the to the growers and the the packagers in Bogota, Colombia. By the time he's done, it's this gigantic journey, and he realizes how interdependent the world really is. Um, and so that also, I think, is a very powerful lesson. And, and just as a, uh, as a chauvinistic pro-Jewish point, um, our new year starts with the creation of the world. And that's pretty unique among religions. The Christian new year starts with the birth and resurrection of Jesus. The Muslim new year starts with Muslims, with um, Muhammad's uh, hijra from uh, Mecca to Medina. Um, the Greek New Year started with the Olympic Games. In other words, everyone thinks the beginning of their tradition, but we don't start with Abraham, nor is Judaism called Abrahamism. 
the way Christianity is called after Jesus, because the essential idea is that this is a deeply universal tradition. And, and the more we see the interconnectedness of the world, uh, the more we realize that's true. I could go on, but I'll stop there. Go ahead. Okay, um, next question. Is it possible to build a religious Jewish community using technology? No. Care to oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> um, so the answer, I mean, in as much as there is an answer, because there isn't an answer. In fact, I will tell you something I wrote recently with the head of corporate strategy for Microsoft. I, read, I wrote an article um, that we published together, uh, she and I called Martin, Martin Buber on Zoom. Martin Buber was a Jewish philosopher. And we talked about the way in which technology is personal and impersonal. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, I'm not looking at you. I'm actually looking at the camera which makes it seem like I'm looking at you. Now I'm gonna look at you. Now that I'm looking at you, you see, it looks like I'm not looking at you. Well, that's very off-putting. Uh, one of the suggestions that I actually made to the Zoom people was, is there any way to create it so that when you're looking at someone, their eyes are the camera? I don't know, that's maybe far in the future, but eventually I think that'll happen because right now it's weird. I'm relating to you only because I'm not looking at you. Um, and so there is an essential distance built into technology, even with its intimacy. Because some people wrote me and said, you know, this is the first time you gave a sermon and I could actually look in your eyes. So technology enables certain intimacies um, because if you sit far in the back of the synagogue, you know, you saw me better this year when you were sitting at home 10 miles away than you did last year when you were sitting a few hundred feet away. Um, so you can build it that way, but I think, and I hope, I, I, this is both a thought, but also a deep wish that we are so wired that we need each other's physical presence. And one of the things that I've discovered, and, and I don't know if you have, but I'd be curious to hear from you. And by the way, all of you are more than welcome to, to write me with questions or comments or so on. Um, my email's easily available and, and I'm um, absurdly compulsive about answering emails, so you'll get an answer. Um, and that's because I'm disorganized. If I was organized, I could put them in files and get to them eventually, but instead what happens is my inbox grows and I just have to answer them all so that I don't feel this tremendous anxiety about a swelling inbox. Um, but the, the thing that I have discovered and I hope that you have too is when you actually see people in person, it reminds you how wonderful and powerful it is to see people in person. And I, and I don't even know that until it happens. And then all of a sudden I see people and I go, wow, that was really, that was great. I had human interaction. So I think you can build elements of a religious community through technology, but I don't think you can build a religious community through technology. And I, and I, frankly can't wait until we're back in, uh, in person again. Um, and, and I hope that it will, part of it will be soon. The rest of it will take a while. We had a question from the chat. In what ways does Judaism help you find your purpose? Um, well, the first way that it helps you find your purpose is the assurance that you have one. And that means that the tradition really does believe that each human being has a part to play in this world. Uh, and, and also Judaism helps you find your purpose in the following, in the following way. Um, because unlike the modern world, it teaches you that you are not your purpose. Most of the world will say it's all about realizing your dreams. But that's not what Judaism teaches. And what Judaism teaches, I think, is both healthier and truer. It says it's all about your helping people to realize their dreams as they help you realize yours. It is a reciprocal process. It's not you go out into the world to realize your dreams and forget everybody else's. No, the idea is 
if you help other people realize their dreams, then there is a symbiosis that grows. And again, it goes back to the question of interdependence. I mean, I walk out in the morning, I take early morning walks, okay? And I walk out in the morning, and the first thing I see, because I live in Westwood, are buildings. And it strikes me, do you know how many people have to cooperate how carefully to build a building? There's so much cooperation and interdependence and mutual help in our world. A lot of it is hidden because it happens every day, so we don't really notice it. But it's all, it's gotta be a confluence of dreams. And so part of, I think, finding your purpose is, what kind of dreams do I wanna help people realize in this world? What is it that I wanna do for others that will help them along the way to discovering who I want to be. Um, it is, uh, when you, part of it is that Judaism's belief is that the origin of all this isn't with you. It's not just that you go out into the world with your gifts and your talents and your ability, all of which is true. You go out into the world with gifts, the talents and ability that go through you, that come from beyond you and move through you in this world, which is why you can do things that you never imagined. It's not only because you have gifts that you don't know you have, but also because you have gifts that you don't have. You have gifts that have you, in a sense. And so I, I think that that's, some, that's an experience that everyone has at a certain moment. Like if you ever, if you've ever been to a soup kitchen and you have fed someone, and you see what it is to literally be able to feed another human being who's hungry, you'll say, I didn't know that that was in me to do that. Um, and, and so Judaism helps you realize your dream by, by tying it, I think, in part to everybody else's. Um, and that, unfortunately, is not the way our society generally teaches people <laughs> that dreams are realized, but it's the truth. Thank you. Yeah, that question was um, from Raquel and Nathan, and this one's from Chanel. She says, aside from the basics, we all know, fasting, atoning, services, self-reflection, betterment, etc. what are some practices you feel are a must leading up to, during, and shortly following Yom Kippur? Um, first of all, my favorite part of that question is that you said following Yom Kippur because that's the hardest part of Yom Kippur. It's not actually Yom Kippur. It's what, hap what happens afterwards, um, because then you have to live up to what it is that you said on Yom Kippur. Uh, so I think the hardest part of Yom Kippur beforehand is to call people, not to call people who are in your life and say, if I did anything to hurt you, I'm sorry. That's sort of perfunctory but to call people that you've hurt and say, I know I hurt you, I'm sorry. Um, to make the difficult phone calls, not the easy ones. Uh, I say this in part because, I mean, we're just talking among our ourselves here, right? So it is not possible, I think, to be a rabbi and not hurt people. It's not possible because there are people who I should have called, who I didn't call, there are people who I called who I didn't say the thing that they wanted or needed me to say. It's not possible. And early on, you have to make a decision, which is, are you going to be able to say you're sorry, even though you didn't intend to hurt anyone and you don't feel like you did anything, but they're hurt? Or sometimes you did do something and they're hurt. And so those phone calls are never easy. They're never easy. Um, but they're among the most important and powerful things that one does. So everybody knows who in their life has been hurt by them. And part of saying you're sorry is acknowledging sometimes that you're sorry, even though that wasn't your intention, um, or even though you don't entirely understand why someone's hurt. Uh, that's one thing. The other is to do a real inventory of your behaviors because 
what tends to happen with, with all of us um, is we judge other people by their behaviors and we judge ourselves by our intentions. And the reason we do that is we have a really good internal grasp on the complexities of why we end up doing what we do. But we're not inside other people. And all we know is they said that really offensive, stupid thing to us. We don't know all the internal dynamics that led to their saying that offensive, stupid thing. Whereas when we say something offensive and stupid, they go, but they don't understand. The reason I did that is because this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. So why are you upset at me? Don't you realize that all those things happen? Um, so we have to try to see ourselves from the outside as much as we can, to see ourselves as others see us. And the best way to do that is to have people in your life who you trust who will be honest with you. Who will say to you, you know, I know, I know you think that you were being a nice person, but you weren't being a nice person, or this was hurtful, or that was hurtful. We need mirrors, all of us. And so pick your mirrors in this world. Um, and, and to pick the people that are close to you, um, having now, um, having had a lot of experience with marriage, both my own. Um, and also um, having gone through a divorce and having married many other people um, and still talking every single day uh, to the woman that I was married to um, and talking all about, uh, obviously, the relationship that we had. And we've now been divorced for 10 years and we still talk every day uh, in those 10 years. Um, I've thought an awful lot about what kind of people people choose to spend their life with and to be close to them. And the best advice that I can give is that you have to choose someone who makes you better. People think that the, the, the idea is to choose someone who makes you happy. Don't, don't go with that. Choose someone who makes you better um, in a way that will obviously make you happy. Happy is important, but you want somebody who sees your potential and wants it to be brought out into the world, not in a nagging, annoying, superior way, but in a partnership way. Um, Ezer Kenegdo, it says in the beginning of the Bible, right? Someone who is opposite you, that raises you. And so that's also part of what I would do before Yom Kippur, is I would go around to those people, the people who see your higher self and want that to be realized in the world and say, what do you think I need to work on this year? What do you remember my doing this year that I shouldn't have done? Um, and be that for someone else or for many other people. Uh, and then lastly, after Yom Kippur, I would say, I mean, I'm a rabbi, Adam Mitzvah, whatever it is. You don't light Friday night candles, light Friday night candles, right? Um, you don't keep kosher, add something of kashrut to your diet, even if it's not, even if you're not going to, I was about to say, if you're not going to go whole hog, but that doesn't seem like the right expression here. Um, do something that, that enhances your Jewish uh, observance. Franz Rosenzweig, who was a Jewish philosopher uh, of the early 20th century, said, when someone asks you, if you do a certain mitzvah, you shouldn't say no. You should say, not yet but you should mean it. You can't go around the rest of your life saying not yet, not yet, not yet. In other words, the idea is you're on a growth trajectory. You really are trying to move further. Um, so pick something. It can be, by the way, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples if you don't do it. Here's one, here's my favorite mitzvah. Um, I don't actually observe it the way you're supposed to, by the way. Uh, I told you I take early morning walks. You're supposed to, when you wake up in the morning, you're supposed to say, which means, I am grateful to you, O God, who has returned my soul to me. Your faithfulness is very great. It's, you begin the day with gratitude. I don't say it when I first wake up. Partly, I'm not always grateful when I first wake up. But I, but I always feel grateful when I walk outside. So I say it every, I make sure I walk outside every morning whether I'm taking a walk or not. And I say it as soon as I walk outside because there's the world. And, and it's a, that is a beautiful mitzvah to add if you don't do it. 
Um, and it gives you, or say the Shema at night before you go to sleep. Um, those kinds of rituals and routines, they become very meaningful over time. They are part of the definition of who you are. Thank you. Okay, well, the next question comes from Russell. He says, what does Judaism teach us about dealing with the unknown in the future and the anxiety that can come along with the unknown? So I will tell you my conclusion again, after, uh, after many years on this earth, that anxiety is inescapable. So if you feel anxiety, don't think, oh, if only I could find the key, I wouldn't be anxious anymore. Um, there are different levels of anxiety, but everybody feels anxiety sometimes about different things because the world by its nature is anxious making. Uh, I mean, even evolutionarily. Boy, if you, were, if you weren't anxious in a world in which there were wild beasts all around, then, you know, actually the, the world selected for the anxious. <laughs> the unanxious got eaten and the anxious <laughs> ran away. Um, so anxiety is not an entirely bad thing. Um, one of the things that I will tell you uh, one trick that I have learned about anxiety, I learned many years ago, I don't know where or how or when, but sometimes it's helpful, is if you're in a particular situation where you're anxious, like if you do public speaking and that makes you anxious, or you go to a party and that makes you anxious, you can in your mind reinterpret anxiety as excitement because physiologically, they're exactly the same. You feel the same things when you're really excited that you feel when you're anxious, but one you identify as anxiety and the other you identify as excitement. So you can sometimes switch your anxiety to excitement. Uh, the other thing that Judaism, I think, teaches, which is true um, and helpful to anxiety, is not that everything is going to be fine. That's not true. It's just not true. We know that. But even when it's not fine, it's going to be fine. By which I mean, whatever happens, whatever happens will happen. And somehow or other, all of us will deal with it. That's the reality. When people say, you know, um, if this person or that person is elected, <laughs> you can fill in the blank however you like, the world will end or the country will be over. One way or another, people do muddle through. We have for many, many, many millions of years. And so don't be, um, don't be too persuaded by apocalyptic scenarios and understand that especially for most of the dilemmas that we're facing, right? We're not, we're, we don't have our hands on the switch of, of climate change, for example, or nuclear weapons. For most of the dilemmas that we are facing, it's really going to be okay. And one of the ways, so one of the advantages, I seem to be, I seem to be returning to this theme several times. I don't usually do this, but, I, but there you go. One of the advantages of getting older um, is that you outlive so many sorrows and fears that when you feel a new sorrow or fear, you can say to yourself, ah, you know, this is bad, but I remember I outlived this sorrow and this fear and this and this, so I'll be okay. Um, George Eliot, who wrote a, uh, a, a novel um, that I have recommended to my colleague, Rabbi Rotenberg, uh, my favorite novel, it's called Middlemarch. It's a Victorian novel, but she was, she wrote under the name George Eliot. It was, a, her real name was Mary Ann Evans, but she thought she'd be taken more seriously if she wrote as a man. Um, and now, by the way, this year and next year, for the first time, they're republishing all of her novels with her real name, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, but anyway, she said once, childhood is soothed by no memories of outlived sorrow. In other words, when you're a little kid, and you're upset about something, you don't remember that you got upset about a thousand other things um, and you outlived them. But the older you grow, the more you realize that the thing you are anxious about probably won't happen, 
or if it does happen, it'll be okay. Play out the worst thing that could happen. Play out the social embarrassment or play out the loss of a job or play out the loss of a person in your life that you think you can't live without. Whatever it is, you'll realize that you will come out the other side of that. You will. So um, I think that that's the most helpful. There is no cure, as I said at the very beginning, for anxiety. All of us will feel anxious. But I think that the most helpful is to know not that everything will be fine, but that you have the resources to deal with a not fine outcome too that you're not weak or fragile, even if you suspect that you are, um, that you will be okay. And, uh, and maybe you'll discover a strength in yourself that you didn't know you had. That happens too. We're getting a lot of great questions in the chat. I just want to invite if everybody, if you want to make sure your question is answered, please um, write it sooner rather than later so it gets addressed. Um, this one comes from GTM Gun Tulos. I don't know what that stands for in the beginning, but welcome. Um, he says, uh, "Why do the days of awe uh, start with a joyous? Why don't the days of awe, uh, you may say, start with a joyous party rather than starting with atonement?" Um, well, the days of awe do start with a joyous party. Rosh Hashanah is actually supposed to be joyous. Um, it's Hayom Harat Olam. But as soon as you realize that the world is created and there is this beautiful world, then you have to start to figure out your place in it and what you do right and what you do wrong. I mean, that's, you know, Judaism is, uh, is kind of a serious tradition that way. Um, so, but also, by the way, we have lost some of, well, we have or haven't lost, I'm talking to Atid, so let me tell you, if you don't know this, on Yom Kippur afternoon, traditionally, I'm talking about Middle Ages, way back, thousands of years, people would go out, young singles would go out into the fields and meet each other. Yom Kippur was the day of matchmaking. So there was always this, um, did you, I, I mean, you read this very unsuitable Torah reading about what, what sexual unions are legitimate and which ones are illegitimate on Yom Kippur. And people always say like, <laughs> really? This is what you're reading on Yom Kippur? You don't have a more elevating Torah reading? And, and the reason is because that's when people would meet each other. Um, so there is always this mix of party and, and people think that like, I mean, you're not gonna, it's not gonna happen so much this year. People think that like meeting each other in the halls and gossiping is a brand new thing, but it always happened um, because human nature has never changed, right? Technology has changed, but human nature hasn't changed. Um, so it did sort of start with a party, uh, but not, not, streamers and funny hats. How can we learn to be more forgiving of ourselves? Um, this is an incredibly important uh, balance to strike to lead a good life. I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to say one other thing about leading a good life. Um, so there are some people who need to be harder on themselves. There are, but mostly, mostly I think people beat themselves up way too much. And I'm gonna make a big generalization here and I hope you won't beat me up for it, but if you do, it's thematic. Um, women beat themselves up more than men do. Now that's not every woman and every man, but as a generalization, I have found that really holds true. And part of it is because society beats them up um, and judges them in ways that they don't judge men. And so women internalize that and start beating themselves up. Uh, and it's a shame and it's something that we really as a society and as individuals need to work on. If you ask me how you stop doing it, the first way that you stop doing it, I think, is to recognize, at least in Judaism, that perfection is supposed to be an attribute of God, but never of any human being. And there is no such thing as a perfect human being in Judaism. Every major biblical figure sins, and not just little sins, like big sins, right? I wrote a book on King David. King David did terrible stuff, terrible stuff. 
adultery, murder, and this is King David, right? This is the progenitor of the Messiah. So Judaism is under no illusions that people are, and most of the things that you beat yourself up for, believe me, if other people were more honest with you, they would tell you they do it too. It's not unique to you. The reason that you are more self-beating is partly because of this, social media, where no matter how much you know that those Instagram pictures aren't how that person looks, or that that Facebook post isn't really how they live, it seeps into you and, and makes us all less happy. I mean, there are all these studies, the more time you spend on social media, the less happy you are. And by the way, the, recently I saw a study, you know which one is the worst on this is Instagram, worse than Facebook, worse than Snapchat, worse than dating sites, um, which is interesting. You can all figure out why that is. But the point is that one of the ways that you stop beating yourself up is by not believing other people's stories as much as, as you probably do. Look, and also, by the way, we are built for negative bias. If a hundred people say to me, I really like that sermon, and one person says to me, that was just stupid, who do you think I remember? As I'm walking home from the synagogue to my house, do you think I think about all the people who said nice? No, can't believe that person said it was stupid. Why would you why would this maybe it was stupid? Maybe those other people are just being nice because you realize when people compliment you, you don't always believe it. When someone insults you, you know they're being sincere, right? So we're always, we're wired that way. We're wired for negative bias, which also makes sense, by the way. You want the negative has to have more impact than the positive because the tiger hiding behind the tree has to have much more impact than walking for a while with nothing happening. Um, and so being aware of all this, but also being aware that everyone else functions this way. And here's where friends really should help. Um, they should let you know you're not the person that you're, that voice inside you keeps telling you you are. Um, and, and maybe, maybe that voice is yours and maybe that voice is someone in your life who has been telling you that. Um, but believe me, believe me, whoever asked this question, whatever it is you're beating yourself up about, 80% of the people on this call have done the exact same thing. And, and some of them beat themselves up over it and some of them forget it. Um, so there is, all of that is worth remembering. And, and this leads a little bit to the second point, which I wanted to make, which is related. And that is um, the most important quality. I really believe this to leading a good life. Uh, and you can, in your own mind, you can decide what that is. And then I'll tell you what I think. Um, I think it's courage. Because without courage, you're a slave. If when someone asks you to do something, you don't have the strength to say no, and not to feel that quaking inside, but to really be able to say no, you're not free. No is the word that gives you freedom, and courage is the ability to be who you are. And those things are helped along by the realization that you don't have forever in this world and that you only have a limited time to realize whatever it is you are supposed to do, and that you really should give yourself to what it is that you believe that is important, um, even if other people don't always agree with that. And that also helps with anxiety, because a lot of anxiety comes from trying to be that which you know you aren't, or you feel you aren't, but you think everybody else will disapprove of you if you don't do it. Um, so maybe you need to go a different direction. Thank you. And Julia added to that in the chat, she says uh, that Maya Angelou, uh, Angelou would support that. She says that without courage, you cannot practice any other virtue. Thanks for adding that, Julia. <laughs> Um, would you comment on the current social climate, including but not limited to Black Lives Matter and the polarization of our um, politics? I will. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of endless uh, discussion. 
So I'll comment on it in this, in a way that I think is helpful as opposed to like, I don't wanna be another political pundit. Um, what strikes me uh, really is that um, there is on all sides of this, as always happens in political debates, a certain amount of dishonesty that creeps in, um, that makes the debate worse. Uh, that is, um, each side sees itself in possession of the entirety of the truth and demonizes the other side um, because they want to either destroy America or um, their racist authoritarians. And, and on both sides, there are people of ill will. I have no question about that. Um, but, but here is a, um, without going into the particulars of the issue, um, what tends to happen in, uh, in social movements is that um, the people who are the loudest and most strident voices on any side um, become the representative voices. And so let me give you an example. I don't know how many millions of people marched, right, in, in all the marches that have happened over the past several months. And I would guess of the millions of people who marched, less than 1% looted and burned in cities. And yet, again, it has to do with negative bias. So much of what you saw and read about and heard about was about looting and burning. Because for obvious reasons, it's big destruction of property and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so, the, and on the right as well, what happens is that the, the, the most uncompromising voices, the cruelest voices, the least admirable actions are the ones that come to represent whichever side you're not on. And, and that's a social problem that is not new. Um, and, and I don't know how you get out of it. I've been thinking about this a lot because what I care about more is how we get out of this division with a better society than we went into it. Um, I do know though, and if this is any help to you, you know, um, remember that when someone says things are unprecedented, I'm, I'm gonna be a little mildly snarky here. Whenever somebody tells you that a situation is unprecedented, what that tells me is they haven't studied history. Nothing is unprecedented. Pandemics are not unprecedented. This social unrest is not unprecedented. In the 60s, in Vietnam, the social unrest was at least as, in fact, it was worse. Um, the National Guard, remember, shot students on college campus, Kent State. Um, so, and we got out of it somehow. So I don't know whether there's going to be something that actually happens um, or whether it will be a more gradual process. Uh, but, but I do the other thing to remember, and, uh, and I think that this is really important for people to keep in mind, is part of this is a product of progress, not only of regress. When my father, right before I was born, my father was a rabbi in the South. And when, we, when, I, when I, I was born after they moved North, um, but he used to tell us about separate bathrooms and people who couldn't ride in the front of the bus. And this was basically in my lifetime. So we're not, I mean, and, and the idea that you would have had a black president, um, nobody, I have to tell you, nobody in my generation or my father's generation would have believed such a thing would be possible. Wouldn't have believed it. Um, so part of it is that there is a, uh, there's a, a flare, like a, a match flares before it goes out. There's a flare when you get close to a goal, but you're not there yet. Um, and, and 
I could talk much more about it, but basically I really do believe that uh, it's not just a function of personalities, it's also a function of social currents. Some personalities, and I will let you decide who, have not made it better. Um, but, uh, but this will be one of those things, believe it or not, that you will live through and you will remember in the future and you'll be able to judge the future by being able to say, listen, you think it's bad now, but I remember, you know, I remember in 2020, things were really bad and we made it through that. We have two more questions. The first is, is there something on your desk that you could share with us that would tell us a little bit more about you? Hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, well, there's a, there's a Viking boat, but that was a joke. Um, I talked about how when I took, I did 23 and me and, and, uh, I gave a sermon about it and there was like, I had, so what happened was my daughter, um, uh, her mom did 23 and me and discovered that she was like 98% Ashkenazi Jew. And my daughter was so upset. She said, like, nothing, can't you give me something like romantic or interesting or whatever? And I said, wait, 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 because I, I, I said, I, I, there's a story in my family that, that Wolfie comes from a, a Napoleonic, a soldier who converted in Napoleonic Wars, is Italian, and, and, and maybe we'll get, anyway, I turned out to be 99% Ashkenazi Jew. But there was like a point oh something that had some affinity to Viking tribes. So I talked about it in the sermon, and, and Eric Diamond bought me a Viking boat off of Amazon that sits on my desk as a reminder of my true heritage. Um, let's see, what else is there? Uh, nothing on my desk particularly. There's, some, there's a booklet uh, called The Kovno Legacy because my family was from Lithuania. Um, oh, I'll tell you something that here is a, here is J.K. Rowling's latest mystery novel. I love mystery novels. This is the fifth in her series. I also read all the Harry Potters, but this is the fifth in her series and as you can see, I'm only a little of ways into it. It's some 900 pages, um, but uh, I read that. And every morning when I take a walk, uh, I listen to Anthony Trollope, his novels, Victorian novels. Um, I, I don't know, I just do, what can I tell you? Uh, and sometimes I listen to podcasts, all sorts of podcasts. Uh, I listen to The Daily, sometimes from the New York Times. I listen to Sam Harris. I occasionally listen to Joe Rogan, I listen to a whole variety of different podcasts, depending on what the topic is and what interests me. There you go. Okay, and our last question tonight is, um, what is our call to action as young adults in our 20s and 30s, both personally and Jewishly in our world today? I have a, I have a really Jewishly, let me start with Jewishly. Um, I think it's incredibly important that you prioritize the um, embrace of Jews who disagree with you. Uh, I really think, I mean, this was what my sermon was about first day Rosh Hashanah. We are 0.2% of the world, 0.2%. And so I know there are Orthodox Jews who delegitimate me. And I know that there are Reform Jews who believe that social justice prior is more important than other Jewish values. And I disagree on one side with one and on one side with the other um, in different ways. But I really try to embrace them as Jews and to feel like there should be a certain love of Jews for one another um, that is powerful and important. And somebody wrote me afterwards, and I want to say this now because somebody wrote me and said, you know, you upset young people when you say that because they feel like it sounds elitist. And I said, I wonder if, if, if a Jew was sitting in an Irish bar and an Irishman got up and said, you know what, Irishmen should love each other. Would the Jew say that's elitist? I don't think so. I think Jews have a certain reluctance to feel like Jews are special um, in the same way that every other group I have ever met thinks they're special, right? I've never met a group, I, Albanians, believe me, Albanians don't go, ah, Albanians not so special. No, they feel they're special too. Jews are the only ones that get a bad rap for this. Um, you're allowed to say, I have extended circles of family and my one of my circles of family are the Jewish people. 
and I care for them and I want to help them and, and they mean a lot to me. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. And I would say that that's a Jewish mission that is not sufficiently articulated in this work. Um, but also I really do believe that this is a world that is better than it used to be, but is still filled with cruelty and suffering, filled with cruelty and suffering. Um, I spent time on interreligious councils talking about, for example, today, spent a long time talking about the situation in Venezuela, um, what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs. Uh, I went through Myanmar and talked to all these monks about what, what they're doing to the Rohingya Muslims. Um, because I, I think that, that Judaism can only be about Jews. It has to be about making God's world better and alleviating the suffering of other people too. And, and if you alleviate the suffering of a human being, you, you've done God's work, however you conceive of God or don't conceive of God, whatever you, you've done sacred work. Think of it that way. Um, I really do believe that, uh, that we have a double mission and I'll close with a story, a true story. Um, that was actually about five years ago on Yom Kippur, she told this story. So Janice Kamener Resnick grew up at our synagogue. Her father was actually president uh, of the synagogue and she's a lawyer in Beverly Hills. So a lawyer in Beverly Hills, you wouldn't think would spend her time going off to the Congo and Sudan, but she has God knows how many times because when the rabbi of VBS, the late rabbi, wonderful rabbi Harold Schulweis, created this Jewish world watch, Janice joined him and she goes to, to these places where there's terrible poverty. And she was once in a tent, women who had been, been abused and raped and, and by the Janjaweed. And she's in that tent with this woman who looks up at her. And obviously this is the only white face. This woman doesn't know why she's there. And she says, why are you here? And Janice knows she has no idea what a Jew is, right? That's not, I mean, she grew up in the Sudan. She never met a Jew, knows about a Jew. So Janice said, I'm here because I'm the member of an ancient tribe. And in our tribe, we believe that every person is an image of God. And that's why I'm here. And I, I think, you know, that's, that's a story that every Jewish parent should tell their children. Um, and, and every Jewish person should tell their friends. And it summarizes both sides of what it is to be Jewish because she was doing it as a Jew with a strong Jewish identification, Jewish World Watch, but it was to help heal somebody who desperately needed her. And believe me, um, I hope you know this, uh, but if you don't, I'll tell you, the world needs you. It needs you individually, you. You have a lot of gifts and a lot of resources, and it is a deeply needy world. So go do good. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rabbi Wolfie, for your time, for answering our questions. Um, I, as I Rabbi... to, yeah, I wanted to echo um, Rabbi Rodenberg as well. Um, Rabbi Wolfie, I know when we initially spoke about this idea, um, and coming up with a way to um, engage young professionals yeah. between the time of Yom Kippur and or Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. If only you could see the chat box that's personally coming to me, I can reassure you that tonight on your walk home, you, you <laughs> need to um, uh, marinate you. over any one negative comment because um, the messages are just bountiful of um, thank you for this opportunity and that everything has almost every question has resonated with every person and this is recorded so we will be sharing it if anybody Great. wants to watch watch it back or share it with someone who couldn't make it tonight um so thank you thank you thank you sure, thank you uh, i just want to add really quickly that rabbi wolpi is also leading um, our kol nidre and yom kippur services the, the um, sinai temple kol nidre and yom kippur services yeah. which we're inviting exactly and on top of that we have a teed programming all day long on yom kippur for ticket holders so we hope you'll join us and for our members the teenage members even if you don't have a ticket 
Thank you. And a teenage member. So for any young professionals, we would love to see you on Yom Kippur and continue this conversation. So thank you again for everybody who joined us tonight. And thank you, rabbis, both of you Hi, uh, for leading us in this inspiring conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody.